All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I hope you're all having a great day. I'm very help happy to welcome back Anjana, um, who will be talking to you guys about the art of functional programming. Um, Anjana, if you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit more, and then we can get started on the talk. Sure. Yeah. Hi, folks. Um, lovely, lovely to not see you, but be here with you uh, in whatever sense of the word. Uh, my name is Anjana Vakil. You can find me on Twitter at my name. Uh, I am a JavaScript developer and educator and developer advocate, and I am a functional programming enthusiast. So I wanted to talk to you all today about functional programming, what it is, why it's cool, how we do it, and how we do some of the things that um, generally are thought of as a struggle for functional programming, how we deal with those things in the world of functional programming. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. It's the art of functional programming. So uh, I, as I said, I'm a, I'm a big fan of functional programming. I think that functional programming is um, a really beautiful programming paradigm. So a paradigm in the sense of a way of thinking about programs and what they're made up of and how they behave that is usually distinguished from other uh, programming paradigms such as object-oriented programming or imperative programming, which have different characteristics. So functional programming is um, really cool and really beautiful because it makes your code extremely easy to predict so that you know exactly what the behavior of your code is going to be so that you can then think about that behavior and expect that behavior and see if that behavior is happening the way that you expect. So it really makes your code super predictable, which has other great benefits. Um, for example, it makes your code much easier to test. When your code is completely predictable and you know exactly what your program is going to do given certain inputs, then it makes it easy to test that and make sure that your functional program is returning whatever it should be returning uh, based on the inputs that you've given it. It also makes programs much easier to debug by the same token because you know exactly what each part uh, or each function in your program is going to be doing, makes it easier to figure out when things are going wrong, where they're going wrong, and isolate those problems, and squash those bugs. So um, these are some of the reasons why functional programming is, I think, really easy to love. A lot of programmers have become enamored of functional programming, especially um, so in, in the academic circles. Functional programming has been a huge mainstay for many decades in the uh, pragmatic kind of day to day uh, productive, you know, working software engineers world. More and more people are getting into functional programming in the last five or 10 years. It's become a huge, huge, huge influence on the industry. And so um, we're going to talk about what it is, why it's so easy to love. Uh, and we're also going to talk about uh, the fact that sometimes it can also be kind of scary. It can be pretty easy to fear functional programming uh, because it comes a lot out of the academic world. It can have a lot of really intense jargon. Uh, words like functors and monads and referential transparency and blah, 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 all of these like really intense terms that can make it seem scary and uh, difficult to, to approach. And um, this is something that I think is a big problem for the world of functional programming. And so personally, I think that functional programming, if we ignore all the jargon and we focus on the core concepts, it's easy enough to understand. We as programmers, even if we've been working exclusively in imperative or object-oriented programming paradigms, we can wrap our heads around the basic concepts of functional programming and how it works. So that even if we don't become full-on hardcore functional programmers, we can take those learnings, understand how functional programming works, and maybe apply a little bit of that uh, mindset to some of the work that we do, even if we're not jumping into a functional language full scale. So that's why we're going to be looking at JavaScript, which allows us to uh, play around with kind of the basics of functional programming without jumping into a language like Haskell or Clojure or Elm or some of these other purely functional languages. So this is kind of a, a personal mission of mine is uh, helping make functional programming more accessible. You might have seen around YouTube a talk I gave um, called Learning Functional Programming with JavaScript, which is going to go more into some of the, the mechanics and some of the techniques that you'll use uh, as a functional programmer. Today, we're going to talk about um, kind of some of the big picture stuff. And uh, so you can check that talk out if you want to dig a little deeper. Um, and by the same token, if you want to dig much deeper, you can check out uh, a course that I give on uh, 
site called Front End Masters that's basically a full um, a full course walking through lots of these um, concepts and techniques. And so these will be good ways to follow on if you want to keep learning about FP after this talk. But uh, for now, for today, um, let us talk about what functional programming is. So functional programming is programming with functions. Super useful, right? Uh, <laughs> I just repeated myself. What does that mean? Of course, we always program with functions. We write function keywords all the time in JavaScript, even if we're not doing functional programming. So what does that mean? Well, it means programming with not just any functions, but pure functions. So what is a pure function? Well, a pure function is one that all it does, all a pure function does in the world is take its inputs, do some kind of computation and return its outputs. That's all the function does. It takes in inputs and it returns outputs. A pure function does literally nothing else. So for example, uh, maybe we have a small function that takes in um, like a width and a height number and then uh, gives back an aspect ratio dividing them. So the inputs are width and height and the output is this ratio. So inputs to outputs, that is what a pure function does. What's important to note is what a pure function um, then becomes, because all it does is take in inputs and return an output based on those inputs, pure functions are completely deterministic, meaning the result of that function only depends on the inputs that you give it and depends on nothing else in the world. It doesn't depend on the time of day, uh, what checkboxes the user had selected, what uh, your, you know, what your, your, what state your program is in, what's going on in the world. None of that matters to a pure function. All a pure function cares about is its inputs. And every time you give it the same inputs, it will return the same output because its output is entirely dependent on its inputs. So that means it's deterministic. Every time you give it the same input, you get the same deterministic output out. It also means that it's stateless. So functional programming is often thought of as programming without state, where state is something in your program, some kind of value that changes over time. Like, for example, which checkboxes a user has selected or what have you. Those kind of values that change over time, we don't work with them in functional programming. We work with deterministic functions where you give them inputs, you get the same output no matter what. So we're going to talk about what that means for day-to-day -day life in this talk. Um, and another thing to note about pure functions is that what they do is return their outputs based on their inputs. What they don't do is any kind of side effect. So a side effect is anything that uh, a function might do that is not returning its output value. So for example, console.log or logging values, that's a side effect because if you put a console.log inside of your function, that's not a return statement. You're not returning the value. You're outputting it on the side and then going on to return your value. So that's a side effect. We don't do that in functional programming. Uh, for example, touching the DOM, appending nodes to the DOM, also a side effect. Modifying something in the outside world that's other than just returning the value from the function, that is a side effect. So we can't touch the DOM in functional programming. Um, and by the same token, we can't even read from the outside world in a function because um, each pure function, as we said, all that it depends on is that the inputs that you pass into it as arguments. So we're not going to, let's say, go select our checkboxes and see uh, you know, what uh, values people have selected or go select an element by its ID and see what, um, what attributes it has on it. Use that, excuse me, use that in our function. We're not going to do any of that. <coughs> pardon me, um, all of that is examples of side effects. And these are things we completely avoid in functional programming. A pure function does not do any of these kind of things. So you might be wondering, well, what can you do then if you can't do any of that stuff? If I can't log anything or touch any of the DOM or read anything from the outside world, doesn't that make functional programming like pretty useless if pure functions can't do any of those things? And that is what we're gonna try to wrap our heads around. No, actually functional programming can do anything that programming can do. But in the real world, we have to make certain adjustments to how we think about functional programming and how we think about our programs um, in order to 
make sure that we're working with pure functions as much as possible so that we can take advantage of that predictability, which is a consequence of the determinism of pure functions. So this is the this is what we're going to try to wrap our heads around in the next, uh, what, 20 minutes, uh, is how does functional programming work in the real world? How do we do the things that we need to do as functional programmers and still take advantage of pure functions and their determinism? So um, in order to understand this, we're going to make some art. So we're going to uh, make some uh, small little uh, geometric, uh, you know, computer generated um, art here. We're going to engage our creative coding muscles a little bit um, using some basic SVGs. So this isn't going to be a talk about generative art or SVGs, but we're just going to use this as an example because art requires a lot of things that people often think of as difficult to do in functional programming. So art requires Making generative art usually requires some kind of side effect because you have to draw something on the screen. And we said that touching the DOM, for example, modifying an SVG, let's say, that's a side effect. So how do we deal with that in functional programming? We're gonna find out. You usually need some element of repetition. Often art, uh, for example, these little, these little uh, graphics that you see here involve some kind of repeated motif or repeated element. So we're gonna figure out how functional programming handles that repetition. You also might need some concept of state or something changing over time. For example, maybe the squares get smaller or maybe the colors change as you go across the row. So we're going to figure out, since we said pure functions don't use state, how do we manage that in our functional programs? And finally, generative art also usually has some kind of element of randomness, some kind of element of unexpectedness where the computer is just sort of choosing random values. And we said that functional programs are deterministic which is the opposite of random. So how do we work with randomness in functional programs? We're gonna dig into these four things. Um, by the way, if folks have questions at any point, feel free to drop them in the Q&A um, or uh, uh, I'll feel free to come off mute and let me know if I'm missing any. Alrighty, so let's take a look at these features, these possibly hard for functional programming features. So side effects being the major one. If we can't do side effects, how do we do anything in functional programming? How do we handle side effects in functional programming? Well, we said that we don't do side effects in pure functions. So what we're going to do is take side effects, which are impure, non-deterministic, non-functional. We're going to push any of those side effects or any of those um, uh, those, those things that we need to do, like touch the DOM or logging or anything like that. We're going to push them to the outer edge of the program, what's sometimes called an outer shell, um, sometimes called an imperative shell, where we distinguish imperative programming, which is where you say, do this and then do that and then do the other thing, DOM, get element by ID, append child, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's going to be our imperative shell on the outside where we do things like touch the DOM, log to the console, et cetera. And then inside, we're going to have a pure functional core to our program so that we get to take advantage of that deterministic quality that makes everything so predictable and easy to test and easy to de debug. We're going to keep the inner core of our program as pure as possible and push everything impure, all those side effects out to the outer edges of the shell. So what does that look like? Uh, let's take an example of, let's say we have a, a, a little HTML file. We have, we have some SVG element, which I'll call art. And that's just going to be kind of a little container for our drawings for our art. Um, and what I've got here is an impure, a non-functional function, as it were, called impure set SVG contents. I'm naming it impure so that I don't forget there's side effects happening here, where that's going to take in some kind of HTML SVG content and it's going to find that art element. It's going to, it's just a quick and dirty, going to set the contents of that art element to whatever I had passed in. And then it's going to return back that element. So that, uh, that, that setting of the inner HTML, that is a side effect. So this function is going to be kind of the outer shell, this impure set SVG contents, it's going to be the outer shell of our program. And the inner core of our program, which we're going to keep pure, will be a function, because in functional programming, every program is a function. Um, and so that's going to be a function that we'll call pure get art that's going to accept some parameters maybe, and it's going to return the contents 
of our beautiful SVG drawing, which then our outer impure shell is going to actually draw on the page. So hopefully folks are with me so far. If not, please uh, please stop me in the Q&A. Um, but this is, this is what we're doing when we are taking any side effects we need to do and pushing them to the outer edge of our program so that then we have an inner core that's nice and safe, nice and deterministic. Okay, so let us press on and take a look at how we can actually draw something interesting. Because right now we just have an outer shell, we don't have any inner core, so nothing is showing up. So let's make some patterns, shall we? It's art time. So let's take a look at this pattern here, um, which, uh, sorry, the, 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 that, uh, green and purple pattern on the top right, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, um, that we're going to see that it involves some kind of element of repetition. And let's see how functional programming can handle that repetition. So in the imperative world, which is what most of us write uh, is imperative code, we're really used to using iteration to handle repetition. So for example, for loops, right? This is an example of iteration where we're going to execute the same chunk of code over and over and over again, changing the value of maybe some variable i or, or you know, some kind of counter or something like that to go through our loop. But that value changing over each iteration of the loop, that's changing over time, that's stateful. And that means that each time we run that inner piece of code, it's non-deterministic, right? Because we don't know where we're at in our I value, et cetera. So imperative uh, iterative loops are a little bit non-functional. Uh, they're, they're not pure functions. And so instead in functional programming, we don't use that looping iteration. What we use is recursion. So the notion of a function calling itself with new inputs. So call, uh, calling itself from inside of its own body to make multiple calls to the same function in order to execute the same chunk of code, the same function body multiple times. So recursion is where it's at as a functional programmer. If you want to nerd out with me in real depth about iteration and recursion and how they're different and when they're useful and how we can kind of use both of them to help the other in JavaScript. I have a whole talk about that called Recursion Iteration and JavaScript, a love story that you can check out. In this talk, we're not gonna get super deep into it, but let's just talk about recursion and how we write recursive functions as functional programmers. So here I have a functional, uh, a recursive function, pure function called get pattern, which is gonna take two colors and a width of the pattern I wanna make, um, and it's going to return this, um, the contents for this nested diamonds thing that we have here in purple and green. Well, lime green and Rebecca purple to be precise. Um, so what we're going to do in this function, in every recursive function, we have two parts, at least two parts. We have one part that is a base case which means it is the part of the function where we do not make a recursive call. This is kind of the thing that stops the recursion from going infinitely, because at some point we have to reach kind of the bottom of this function. And so the base case is that bottom that says, hey, don't make another call to this function, just return something simple. So in this case, we're starting out with a tile, we'll call it this tile, which is basically just a rectangle with the given width and of uh, the first color. Um, sorry, it's a square, actually. It's got the same width and height. So in any case, if in our base case, if the width is small enough, if it's lot less than 20 pixels, let's say, then we're just gonna return that simple rectangle and be done with it. And that is our base case. This is what's gonna stop our program from running infinitely. But in order to get that repetition, in order to get more than just one solid colored square, we also need a recursive case. So we're going to, in the recursive case, if the width is not smaller than 20, less than or equal to 20, then we're going to return a concatenation of the original tile. And then what we're going to do is, uh, this is just some SVG, so we're just going to rotate for the next inner part of the drawing and shrink the width. Um, by the value of the hypotenuse of that triangle, what have you, we're going to then call get pattern again with our colors swapped in order so that the next rectangle we get is the other color. 
and with a smaller width multiplied by this this hype is just a it's a scaling uh number so what we're going to do then is get in that call to get pattern, we're going to keep calling get pattern, swapping the colors and reducing the width every time until we reach a small enough uh, square in the middle and we're rotating every time. So we're getting this kind of nested diamonds pattern. So hopefully everyone is with me. If not, please, please ask a question. But this is how uh, an example of how we're gonna use recursive functions to accomplish the same type of repetition that in imperative function, in imperative programming, we would accomplish with iterative loops. So the important thing to remember about recursive functions is you have a base case and you have a recursive case. And so we have our little lime green Rebecca purple pattern. All right, let's take a look at a different type of pattern now. How about just a, a grid? Now, I think most of us as, as imperative programmers would think, okay, no big deal. We do a, you know, four like columns uh, and then a nested for loop of four, you know, rows and we draw all of the squares. But we don't have access to for loops in functional land. We're going to have to do this recursively. So while I take a, a sip here, I'm going to let you all ponder the question, how, as functional programmers equipped with only recursive functions, would you draw a grid like this of squares? Let's say this made up of squares. Don't worry about the lines. Now, unfortunately, I can't hear you, what you're saying. But I'm going to imagine that you're thinking, really hard right now, scratching heads, rubbing chins. Um, what we have to do is think a little bit differently as functional programmers uh, who are all about recursion. What we need to start with is some kind of base case. So what we can ask ourselves is what's the simplest thing that I could possibly draw here? Well, imagine that my grid was just one by one square. Imagine I just had one square to draw. Well, that would be our base case. So our base case will be just draw the first square. Then what we can do is have not one, but two recursive cases. So in one recursive case, we can say, all right, what if, so if, if, the, if the width is small enough and the height is small enough, we're just gonna draw this one square. But if we have more columns to draw, then in a recursive case, we're going to draw the rest of the first top row in our recursive Hi, case. Hi. Sorry, um, Nikolai is asking a question. What if the field is sufficiently large to cause a stack overflow? OK, great question. So um, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I guess I'll click this button. So um, yeah, great question, Nikolai. So a stack overflow, um, if folks are not familiar, is essentially what happens when you have a recursive function that calls itself so many times that JavaScript or whatever environment you're running your code in, runs out of memory to keep track of each of those function calls. There's something called a call stack where for each individual call to a function, we get a new chunk of memory on that call stack. And if you have a deep enough recursion, you can overflow or blow uh, that call stack. So there are various optimizations that, um, that can be made to avoid that. There is something that was um, available in certain JavaScript engines. I think these days, the only one that implements it is Safari, but uh, earlier versions of V8 implemented this as well. Uh, that's the engine behind Chrome and Node. Um, the uh, concept of tail call optimization is one strategy to get around this problem of stack overflow. This is where we write our recursive functions in a special style, which then the JavaScript engine knows how to use how to read that style and turn our recursively written code into something that on the call stack operates more like a for loop. So tail call optimization is one strategy to work around um, stack overflows. Um, another strategy is increasing the size of your stack. But another strategy is to think about uh, the, the underlying problem that you're solving. And if you are trying to solve a simple problem with a super, super, super deep recursive function, there might be a better way to architect your code so that you don't need to recurse so deeply. So it's kind of a, a, an open question. There are 
answers on the uh, engine side of things, on the language implementation side of things, and there are answers in terms of how we write our code. Uh, we're not going to go into detail onto that, but it's a it's a great question to look into. And one particularly, I think, particularly interesting solution is called tail call optimization or TCO. So you could check that out. Um, okay, hope that answers your question, Nikolai. Um, and let us get back to our uh, small enough <laughs> field here of squares. So um, one of our base, so we said, okay, our base case uh, is going to be our first square. Our, and if we only have one row and one column, then we're done. If we have more columns, then we can draw the rest of the first row in a recursive call. And then if we have more rows, we can draw the rest of the rows recursively in another recursive case. So in this, in this approach, we're gonna have one base case that first square, and then two recursive cases, the rest of the first row, and then the rest of the rows below that. So here is a lot of code. <laughs> no, it's not too bad. It's, um, it's, it's essentially what we just talked through. So in our first part of our function, we're going to have this function called get tiles. It's going to take in, and remember, functional programming, we, we need to pass in all of the information that we care about. We need to pass it in as arguments to the function. So it's going to take in a width and a height, of the drawing we want to draw, it's going to take in a number of columns and a number of rows of how many squares we want in our grid. Um, a, a make tile function, which we're going to talk about later. So a make tile function that's going to draw the individual tile. And in this case, we're going to use as our make tile function something called make basic tile down at the bottom here, which is just going to basically draw a solid colored rectangle of the appropriate width and height. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to figure out based on the width and height and the number of columns, how um, wide each column and each row is going to be. We're going to then um, make our individual tile. And we're gonna talk about that new data later. We're gonna make our individual tile for this particular tile that we're drawing. And then we're gonna figure out, okay, we're gonna first return that tile. This is our base case. If we are, if we have, only one column and or zero and only one row or zero, then we're done. And that's our base case and we're done. If we have more than one column, then we're going to concatenate that tile onto another uh, sort of moved over call to get tiles where we're reducing the width by one column's worth of width. And we're reducing the number of columns by one and we're passing in our same make tile function and we're drawing the rest to the right. And then if we have more rows left to draw, same deal. We're concatenating those two prior cases onto our um, another call to get tiles that's going to draw the rest of the rows in our graphic, like we saw on the previous slide, um, where we're basically passing in to the get tiles function a reduced row height, because we just drew the first row, and then a reduced number of rows, and then we're getting out the rest of the image. So this is uh, another look at repetition in um, a in something that we might struggle to do if we're starting out in functional programming. But once we start thinking about problems recursively, once we start getting used to recursion being the lever that we can pull to solve these repetitive problems, it becomes sort of second nature to think about problems this way instead of in the looping, you know, four column, four rows, that sort of that sort of thing. So hopefully everybody is still with me. We're running a little long for time, but I think Alper, we have uh, we have a full hour for this. Is that right? We'll find out. All right. Well, someone will cut me off yep. if I am. Uh, good. Okay. Great. 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 Okay. Um, so what we've done now is we've looked at how functional programming handles repetition. What we still need to figure out is how does functional programming handle the thing that we said we're not allowed to do, which is use state. So this is where values would change over time um, as we might do, for example, when we do, you know, uh, the, the I incrementing every run of a for loop, for example. So the way we do this in functional programming is we don't, we don't use state. We don't think about values changing over time. We think about data. We, instead of thinking about the values that we want to change as state, so meaning as a single value that's changing over time, we think about it as data, 
where we have some kind of old data that represents the world of the program that we care about. And when we call our function, it takes in that old state as data. And what it returns out is not just the output value of the function based on that old state and whatever other inputs we want to give it, but also a new piece of data that might be similar to the old piece of data with just a couple of values different, but is basically going to be a completely new piece of data that represents the new changed state. Although nothing is actually changing, all we've got still is inputs where we have whatever other inputs we need to the function. And then also this state object usually, or some kind of value representing the state. And then our outputs are now going to be kind of double. We're going to have whatever value we care about coming out of this. And then also the new representation of the world that we could call the new state. So we treat state like data. And the way that this works, let's take a look at an example where we're going to apply basically what we just did with our um, our squares grid, but let's try to make it a checkerboard where all of the squares aren't just the same kind of boring color because that's barely art. Um, let's try to make it a checkerboard where the squares alternate colors. Now, in order to do that, when we're drawing our get tiles, we're going to have to remember which color we just drew so that we can draw the other one next. Now, remember in our previous version, one way that we did that was by representing which color we have to draw next by the order that we passed in those color arguments. And we switched them each time to alternate green rectangle, green squares and diamonds and purple ones, if you remember a few minutes ago. Um, what we're gonna do here is we're going to actually represent the state of the world that we care about with a little object. So in this new function that I have called make checker tile, which is gonna be passed in as our make tile function to our get tiles, we have not just the width and height, but we also have a little object here that I'm gonna pass in that contains whatever state I care about in the world. And that's going to be some array of colors and then also an index into that array that tells me what the current color is. So for example, I could pass in a colors array of orange and hot pink and a color index of zero, meaning orange, and start drawing from there. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna return not just the SVG contents that we need, but an array that has first the SVG contents, so the, the return value of our function, and then another value that is essentially an updated, uh, a new object that represents an updated state of the world of the program. So in this case, we're going to take the color index and increment it uh, and then do a little uh, mod by the colors length so that we loop around to the beginning if we've reached the end of the array of colors. So what we've got now is that each time we recursively call this function, if we go back to our previous example, we saw that when we called um, make tile, oops, sorry. Uh, when we called make tile here, we're capturing the new data. So that's now the second thing that's returned by my array. And before sneakily, we were just returning a simple object the same as the previous one. Um, this new data now is what we're gonna pass in as the data to any successive calls to get tiles. So where we had that data passed in originally, we are gonna give the program an opportunity to update it. Now this is a completely new piece, new piece of data here, but we're gonna pass that in in order, to, um, in order to, let's say, change the color index for our next call to get tiles. So that is how we're going to apply the same recursive principle and just pass in this new make tiles function, make checker tile, that's going to now return the appropriate new data to help us change the color of the first rectangle, the first square, every time we successively call this get tiles function. And what you might also notice is that we didn't have to change anything about our original uh, get tiles function. We're just passing in a new make tile function. This is another great advantage of functional programming is how modular it is. Because everything is a function, you can just swap one out in your program and because we can pass around functions as data, as inputs or outputs from arguments, uh, from functions, we can 
um, use those functions, swap them around, plug and play like they're little Lego bricks and avoid rewriting code over and over again. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at uh, some very simple graphics, how about we draw something that actually has real world application? All right, I'm not wearing them because the camera angles would be awkward, but check out these pants I found. I don't know if you can see them, but they're like this weird trippy geometric pattern. I saw these in a window and I was like, A, I need these. B, I need to code these. So uh, just, to, just to bring a little fun into it, take a look at this trippy 60s geometric pattern. This is by a small design shop in, in uh, Hungary. Um, we're gonna try to draw this. Cool? So we have everything that we need uh, already. So let's figure out how we draw this pattern. So here is a digital version um, of this trippy geometric pattern. This is what we're gonna try to draw. So I'm gonna, as I take another sip here, give you all a second to think about how using, again, all of the tools that we've covered so far. So recursion and um, this notion of passing in new state uh, objects, returning a new state from the old uh, input state to change values over time or pretend to, how would you take those and put them together to code up a pattern like this? Hmm. No, just kidding. It's not a quiz show. All right, let's see. In the interest of time, let's press ahead. First thing we're going to do to make our lives simpler is let's just say that we've applied a rotate to this whole thing. So that'll be our last step. So let's unrotate this pattern and make it a little bit more square edged so that we can think about it more clearly. Now, do you notice anything about this uh, about this pattern now that we've unrotated it? It basically breaks down into kind of a checkerboard like we had before, uh, or, or should I say a, a tiled uh uh, square like we had before. And within that tiled square, we'll notice that it's a repetition of the same tile over and over, which is in that yellow box here. And if we zoom in on that individual tile, what do we notice about this? Well, because you can't answer me, I'll answer for you. So this is actually a series of checkerboards. This is four different checkerboards. We have one big one, which just looks like that checkerboard that we just drew. Another one that's squished, that's like narrow next to it. Um, a, a similar one that's kind of squished in the other direction. So it's wide um, underneath the big square. And then a little, a little one that's just regular square checkerboard that's just smaller than the first one. So we have a big one, a narrow one, a wide one, and a small one. And I don't know what angle y'all are looking at me at, but you get the idea. Um, so we just need to draw four different checkerboards with the right dimensions, squish them together, tile them out using our original basic tiling kind of function, and then uh, rotate the whole thing and we'll have our pattern. So let's figure out how to draw these <laughs> this pattern. So what we've got here, we're, we don't have to go through this uh, line by line, but essentially what we're looking at, we've got just some little ratio, this split ratio is like, what's the ratio of narrow to wide, et cetera. Um, we're going to figure out using that ratio what the squished uh, width and height are going to be. And we're going to compute the new data for the next run of our make tiled tile function. Um, and what that's going to do is take whatever data we had before, update the color index so that we basically start the next checkerboard with the opposite color. Oops, sorry. So that we start like the first checkerboard starts with orange, the second one starts with pink and so on and so forth so that we get this nice alternation. So that's what we're doing here with this data N. This N is just gonna um, tell us how many um, squares make up each one of those checkerboards. So like five in this case, uh, we're gonna use that to decide whether we need to start with the same color or the opposite color to make things continuous. Then what we're gonna do is draw our big square, our narrow square, our wide square, and our small square. 
And in each of those, we're going to make a call to get tiles because each of those is going to be its own little tiled piece of art um, that essentially is just a question of passing in the right width and height. And we're going to pass in our checkerboard function, our make checker tile. So we just pass in either the, the big width and height or the small width and height and so on and so forth, uh, as you can probably see for the, the narrow and the wide versions. And then the small one is going to get the small versions of both. And then what we return is essentially just a concatenation of all of these together, our big tile. Um, then we're going to move our narrow one over so it's next to it. We're going to move our wide one down so that it's uh, below it. And we're going to move our small one down and to the right, which direction, um, so that everything lines up. So we're just using those transform functions to line things up and boom. Then we apply a rotate on top of all of that and we've got our trippy fashion. So that's pretty fun, right? Now this is, uh, you can, uh, you know, functional programming for fun, profit and fashion. Um, so this is everything we can do with repetition and recursion. You can make whatever, you can do whatever functionality you need to do. We're using art as our example here, but it's just a question of kind of bending your mind a little bit and thinking about problems a little bit differently. So let us talk about this last uh, thing to tackle here, which is irregularity, randomness. How do we, so our previous patterns have been pretty regular. They've been pretty uh, unchanging and therefore not that surprising and not that interesting. And usually when we're making art, especially with computers, we want it to be cool and surprising and be like, whoa, the computer drew that, that's cool. So let's try to add a little irregularity, a little randomness. Um, so how do we handle randomness in functional programming? We said that pure functions are deterministic. That means that I can't just have some kind of randomly changing output every time I call the function with the same inputs. We said that pure functions, when you call them with the same inputs, you always get the same output. So that means I can't just have like a math.random value in there that's changing the output value every time because that would violate the, the whole point of functional programming is the determinism and the predictability. So how do we handle randomness in functional programming? We don't. And actually, it turns out that no computers handle randomness. There is no real notion of pure, uh, or I should say true randomness in computation. Computers are deterministic machines. So we don't ever have real randomness in computers. What we do have is pseudo randomness which uh, gives us values that are kind of distributed in the same distribution as random values, but they can actually be predicted. Usually this is accomplished by means of having some kind of pseudo random number generator that operates on the basis of a seed, some kind of value that kicks off this ran pseudo random number generator so that if we pass in the same seed, we get the same random set of numbers. But then from those random numbers, we can pull out values that behave as if they were random. So what we're going to do is work with pseudo randomness. And this is what all computing does, whether you're working in imperative programming or functional. Um, and so we're going to use an algorithm for generating these pseudo random numbers called simplex noise. So simplex noise is a cool algorithm because what it does is it gives you a field in two or three dimensions. We're gonna look at just a two dimensional field of values that look random, like pseudo random, and they look like just noise. So if you zoom out on that field, you see what's on the left-hand side here is basically you, you get what looks like just static or noise. So um, this is a grid of you know a different uh, value from this noise field at each of the locations on that grid. Um, what we're going to do is to get a number out of this simplex noise field, we sample the noise field, we look at a pixel in the noise field at a particular x and y coordinate, and we see what that value is. And so if you zoom out on this noise field, what you see is just random noise. What's cool about simplex noise is if you zoom in, you actually find out that these values are actually kind of related to each other, left to right and top to bottom. So what you get if you zoom into the field is a more smoothed out but still kind of randomly varying uh, field of noise. So this is what we're gonna do to work with randomness in functional programming. We're gonna generate a pseudo random noise field of values that look random. 
And we're going to then use that in our peer functions to create unexpected art, even though our program will be still deterministic. So let's take a look at how we could do this in JavaScript. So there is a library for simplex noise. We're just gonna pull it in. And that is an impure operation, right? We're pulling something down from NPM, no less. Who knows what's on NPM at any given moment? Could be anything. And so anytime we're reading from the outside world and the value of this simplex noise is gonna depend on something out there that could change over time. So not deterministic, that is impurity. So we're definitely gonna want this simplex noise um, instantiation to be on the outer shell of our program, just like a side effect, right? Just like we did before with touching the DOM, we're going to have that wrapped in an impure get noise field function that's going to generate a new simplex noise field from a particular seed that I give it. And we're labeling that function as impure to remember that this is non-deterministic because who knows what the value of that library is when we require it. But once we've instantiated that noise field from a seed, now we are going to be able to see that everything is pretty deterministic. So when I, when I create a noise field, calling my impure get noise field with a particular seed, I get this noise 2D function, which allows me to, or method, which allows me to sample the noise field at a particular X and Y coordinate to get a pseudo random value. And what we'll notice is that if I instantiate the noise field with a certain seed, then if I create some other noise field with a different seed, I get a different value at that location. But if I create a new noise field with the same original seed, this hello noise in this case, then that noise field is gonna be exactly the same. So this is where our pseudo random number generator, because it takes in that seed, it is still deterministic. We're gonna get the same values out for every time that we call it with the same inputs in the seed in this case. So that's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna isolate the instantiation, the, the the calling of this library into our outer shell. And then within our shell, everything that we work with with that noise field is gonna be deterministic. So what we can do, for example, is create a make random tile function that's going to basically take in some array of colors, um, some uh, noise field that we've created that we've gotten from the outer edge of our program and some tile index as state to remember where we are in the image that we're trying to draw. And what we can do is just sample the noise field at the particular width and height that we are looking for. Um, sorry, at, at the X and Y coordinates of where we find our tile based on its index, like we could start in the corner and go zero through number of tiles and so on and so forth. Um, and then we're going to compute the color in our array of colors that corresponds to that noise value. So in this case, we're just kind of taking the absolute value, scaling it up by a certain number to make things vary in a nice way. And you could tweak all these parameters if you were actually doing uh, art, but this isn't an art talk. So let's uh, let's pretend that this is just taking, um, it's just kind of transforming our noise into a particular color out of the array, randomly, pseudo randomly selecting a color from the array. And then what we're going to do is just draw a rectangle with that color. And then uh, in the, the new data that we're going to pass out, we'll just update, increment the tile index. So now we get a kind of like colored version of a static sort of uh, like, like radio TV noise kind of image. So randomness happening. Yes. Is it super cool? And debatable. Depends on your taste of art. But we can use this principle to do all kinds of things now. So for example, just as, a, just as a simple example, what if instead of just choosing a random color and drawing a bunch of squares because we're bored of that, we use those random values to do something a little more cool. Like for example, here I have this make clock tile where what this is gonna do is draw a little kind of clock image, which is going to be a random color or in this case, a, a regularly rotating color using our checkerboard approach. And then a randomly uh, oriented little hand there so that we get this kind of nice organic seeming variation uh, in our image. And so in order to figure out what that degree is of how far rotated we want the clock's hand to be, we're going to use our noise field to pull out a value here based on this tile index. We're going to just multiply it by a couple of things to get something that works as a degree to rotate. 
And then we're going to kind of draw the circle and the line at that rotation correspondingly. And then what we're doing is we're actually just taking the colors and rotating through them regularly. We're not choosing a random color for each one. This adds a nice mix of kind of predictability and then also randomness to our, to our image. So this is just an example of how you could use these random pseudo random values. Um, but you could imagine you can, you can extend this to all kinds of different things in functional programming where you need that element of surprise, but you don't want to give up the determinism of your functional program, which was the whole advantage. So let us recap everything that we've made. And I'm glad we had the extra time because we're super over time. But everything that we've made um, is we made all of this art. We also did it using side effects, which we pushed to the outer imperative shell of our program. We used repetition by means of recursion. We used state by means of new data based on old data. And we used randomness by means of pseudo random number generators pushed to the outer imperative shell of our programming using a seed, which give us these deterministic random-ish noise fields. So we've done a lot. And um, this, is, this is it for me. You can check out the code from all of these um, little drawings, as it were, uh, on my um, site on observablehq.com. So that's a, a platform for, it's really fun for creative coding. And so I have a, a collection of notebooks in the art of functional programming there. You can check out the examples of the art and play with it. You can switch around colors and change values and, and, and have an explore. Um, so you can check that out. And yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Anjana Vakil. So thank you so much for, for joining. And thank you again for having me. And of course, if there's questions, I'm happy to chat. Thank you so much for the talk, Anjana. I really appreciate it. It was really great. Um, yeah, as Anjana said, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, we have a couple more minutes. So maybe to get it started, um, it's a relatively simple question, but maybe people are wondering how they can use functional programming throughout their careers since most of these students are college students who are looking to kickstart their careers in the CS and engineering industries. Yeah, so functional programming is a really foundational paradigm for um, a lot of, well, computer science on the one hand. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of work on functional programming. And would say increasing number of um, not just languages, of course, there are kind of functional languages out there, which some of them are growing a lot and, and end up having very good um, career perspectives for, for folks entering the industry. I'm thinking languages like Clojure and Haskell and Scala. These are languages that, uh, you know, they often are really great um, to work in and, um, and people find them really enjoyable and they can also be very lucrative because it's uh, you know in demand or there's more demand than there are functional programmers. But even if you don't end up going into functional programming as your job, let's say, it's really useful as a foundation for understanding a lot of um, libraries and, uh, and tools out there in the world of software engineering. So for example, some very popular frameworks in languages like JavaScript, for example, React is very much based on some functional programming ideas, even if it's not a pure functional library. Um, you also have um, languages or, or systems coming out that, that try to take ideas that were developed in functional programming languages and apply them in other contexts. For example, the language Clojure has done some really interesting things with data structures, and that's now used by certain, let's say, um, databases that employ those strategies learned from the functional programming world to make really efficient and predictable and, um, and interesting uh, kind of database approaches. So there are a lot of ways in which a core, even if you don't become a functional programmer per se, um, having a foundation in understanding functional programming concepts, at least the major the major ones, the big, the big picture ideas and the uh, kind of core techniques can be really helpful for understanding other tools and languages and frameworks. 
Um, and then I see we have another question, which is not at all a dumb question. There is no such thing as a dumb question. Um, is, uh, is functional programming the opposite of object-oriented programming? Great question. So they are often portrayed as opposites. It's often portrayed that there's like some kind of big war between functional programming, where we do everything with pure functions and we think about everything as transformation of data, data in, data out, versus object-oriented programming, where people often think about it as being about the entities, the objects, and how they inherit one from the other. And so often, in the day-to-day -day language that programmers use, they will talk about these as kind of, if not opposites, then in contrast. But I would say, and I actually have a talk about uh, object-oriented programming that you, I don't know, that goes into this, um, that object-oriented programming is not that different from functional programming, if you really kind of zoom out and squint a little bit that they, um, it, it depends on what we mean by object-oriented programming. And if we think about object-oriented programming as like classes and inheritance, then not so much. But I would argue that the actual meaning of functional program, of, of object-oriented programming, um, going back to the creator of the paradigm, or let's say the founding father of the paradigm, who is Alan Kay, um, who developed the language Smalltalk, which was kind of one of the most, the, the prototypical object-oriented language. Um, he talks about it as being much more about these objects all being able to exist on their own, have encapsulate their own state, and then send messages to each other by means of method calls, let's say, that allow them to kind of pass data back and forth and, and, and influence each other back and forth. And if you think about functions as being able to send messages to each other by means of their input arguments and their return values, it ends up not being that super different to think about. It's just kind of a different thing that you're focusing on. Are you focusing on the data transformation? Are you focusing on the entities that do that? So anyway, this is a big wormhole that we could go into, but um, it is distinct from object-oriented programming. It is often cited as a, in contrast to object-oriented programming. But I would say that what it really stands in more contrast to is kind of the parent paradigm of object-oriented programming, which is imperative programming. So imperative programming, so object-oriented programming is one type of imperative programming, we could say, where imperative programming is a way of thinking about programs where we think about commands. We think about telling the computer, do this and then do that and then do this other thing, assign to this variable and then you know increment that by five and then put this value at this address in memory and then print this to the console. So I would say that if we want to look for an opposite to functional programming, a more fitting opposite would be imperative programming. But this is a very long answer to a short question. Um, the answer is kind of, I think. So, so object-oriented programming and functional programming, definitely distinct paradigms, very useful to know the differences between. Um, but I would say that functional programming is more in contrast to imperative programming than object-oriented. I hope that helps. I could easily nerd out about this for another hour. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna. <laughs> lock it down. <laughs> um, but yes, I do have another talk out there called, uh, it's called Oops, I Misunderstood OOP or something like that, um, that I think you can find on the speaker deck uh, that I, uh, on my speaker deck site that I linked y'all to. I also have a talk called Programming Across Paradigms that you can find out there that um, goes into the different types of programs paradigms, the, the, the key ones, the major ones that we often hear about and how they differ. So that might be of interest. Um, I can link y'all to that. Uh, well, I, it's, it's in that speaker deck, um, but you can also search on YouTube, programming across paradigms. Cool. Do we have any other questions or are we all ready to go write some recursive pseudo-random art based on our closet? No, just me. <laughs> I believe that's all the questions. I hope someone else. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, oh. Say thank you so much. Thank I you. Thank else, you all for joining me. I hope someone else also tries to 
um, replicate their closet in that way. That was really cool. I really hope so. If you do, I would yeah. love to see. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure to see. Right. Yeah, definitely. All righty. Well, right. thank you all so much for, for joining and uh, for having me. And yeah, have a great thank you so uh, weekend. Much for the talk. Thank you so much for the talk. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for coming by. Um, have a great day. Bye, Bye everyone. Folks. Bye. Thank you again, Anjana. Thank you. Bye.